Tonight, the urgent bid to keep the state's most dangerous criminals behind bars before they escape through a legal loophole. The Water Minister finally breaks her silence over Adelaide's bill bungle, but question time yields few answers. And cutting a fair deal for working fathers calls for a national scheme of paid leave for mums and dads. Ten News at Five with George Denikian and Rebecca Morse. Also tonight, a heavily pregnant teen rushed to hospital, doused with acid during a southern suburbs fight. Adelaide's desalination plant a step closer as a trial takes shape off Port Stanvac. And a buyer's guide to used car safety, pre-owned people movers with protection for less than $5,000. Good evening. Emergency legislation is being rushed through Parliament tonight to keep some of the state's worst criminals behind bars. The action closes a loophole in existing laws that could set free murderers and rapists. Kevin Riley is serving a 23-year sentence for the most chilling of crimes on the most innocent of victims. Seven-year-old Sean Phillips was strangled at Brooklyn Park in the late 1980s. Riley and his brother Jim were convicted of murder and attempted rape. The parole board has repeatedly refused their release, but a legal loophole could give the Riley brothers and at least eight other serious criminals automatic parole. We are worried that a decision of the Court of Criminal Appeal could lead to uh, 10 hardened criminals, uh, among whom are convicted murderers, being released onto the streets of Adelaide. The government was jolted into action following a Supreme Court application by Shane Andrews, who's serving a life sentence for a shooting murder in Aberfoyle Park in 1991. Andrews has been repeatedly denied bail, but claims he should be released automatically because he was convicted before truth in sentencing laws were introduced in 1994. The opposition says the application could trigger a flood of appeals from prisoners serving lengthy sentences. And there could be as many as 20 prisoners in this state who were incarcerated prior to the legislation in 1994. Andrew's ex-partner has assumed a new identity, fearing his release. She's said her greatest fear is that he'll come for her children. He sent threatening letters saying he was innocent and that if he really was a murderer, he could have got someone on the outside to kill me. It wouldn't surprise me if he tried to get me or the kids. The legislation has passed the House of Assembly. The government is now racing to gain upper house approval ahead of the Supreme Court's decision on Andrew's appeal. Matt Doran. 10 News. A gruesome final chapter of the Snowtown murders is closing in the Supreme Court. A sex abuse victim will be sentenced for the bashing murder of a pedophile, the same pedophile who abused serial killer James Blasakis. Convicted pedophile Geoffrey Payne suffered a violent death, brutally bashed near his Northfield home in April last year by an angry sex abuse victim, teenager Timothy Schaefer. Today, during sentencing submissions in the Supreme Court, Schaefer's lawyer Greg Mead said his client had simply snapped after a decade of physical and sexual abuse. It's as if Payne came to represent to Schaefer the various people who had beaten, abused, molested and mistreated him. A similar motive was given by James Vlasakis when he was jailed over four of the 11 Snowtown murders. Payne had abused Vlasakis as a child, ultimately leading the disturbed teenager into the clutches of gang leader John Bunting, who had a hatred for pedophiles. Schaefer also showed the same ferocity. The court heard he visited Payne after a night of drinking. They argued and Schaefer stabbed Payne in the leg before viciously bashing and ultimately strangling him. Neighbours told police of hearing thudding like a basketball bouncing on the ground. Schaefer, who was 18 at the time, stomped so hard on Payne's head it crushed his skull. Schaefer will be sentenced later. Kimberly Harper, 10 News. Water Minister Colleen Maywald has finally defended her role in the SA Water billing blunder. She maintains she didn't know the price hikes would be backdated, something the opposition finds hard to believe. Some involved in the $10 million water bill fiasco are still steaming, but like the Treasurer and the Premier, Water Security Minister Carleen Maywald is happy to shoulder the blame. We were wrong. That the legislation meant that it would be backdated to December and we did not have a full comprehension of that fact. 
Can we really believe that the Water Security Minister who runs SA Water had no idea about the billing system SA Water uses? Give me a break. SA Water has also apologised for backdating the 13% price hikes to December last year instead of applying them at the beginning of this month. Labor's top two were both interstate when the bungle was revealed last Friday. The opposition demanded details of who knew what. In the early evening, I received, late afternoon, early evening, received a message uh, from my office and my response was, fix it. Uh, late in the afternoon. What's the big deal about it? I mean, I've said publicly, Mr Speaker, there's no huge uh, conspiracy issue. Away from the politics, all most people care about is how and when they're getting their money back. The bad news is it might not happen until December. There's no word yet on whether customers will get a cheque reimbursement or a reduction on their next bill. Daniela Retorto, 10 News. The widow of the man killed in the Beaconsfield mine collapse has told of her grief at the opening of the inquest into her husband's death. Jackie Knight says she hopes the inquiry will prevent others from suffering a similar fate. For Larry Knight's widow Jackie and brother Shane, the start of the coronial inquest is the latest and most important part of their search for answers. In a statement read on Jackie's behalf by the family lawyers, she spoke of her pain. I simply don't want any other mining family to experience the pain that we have experienced. Lawyers for the mines management told the court that while there had been rock falls deep below Beaconsfield in the months prior to Larry Knight's death, all possible safety checks had been made. They said the collapse on Anzac Day in 2006 was caused by a massive unforeseeable seismic event. The mine's lawyers then raised concerns that some senior miners who heroically rescued Todd Russell and Brant Webb were now being blamed for the collapse. The question is being asked, was anyone to blame? And we are saying quite clearly no. In a surprise move, lawyers for Beaconsfield Gold withdrew from the inquest, saying they would only return to support and cross-examine senior mine management. The family are uh, disappointed by what transpired today. Beaconsfield Gold, which had attempted to shut down the inquest earlier this month, says it has no more evidence to give and its involvement will only distress the family more. We don't see that our being there to cross-examine witnesses would uh, in any way ease their, um, their difficulty through this process. The inquest will move to Beaconsfield tomorrow where coroner Rod Chandler will examine the area where Larry Knight died. In Launceston, James Wakeland, 10 News. The Rudd government claims it's already halfway to cutting hospital waiting lists, but the states are warning they'll seek compensation if health insurance changes drive more patients to public hospitals. Kevin Rudd launched a new book on his winning campaign this morning. Thank you. I recognise you. <laughs> a key election promise was to immediately pump $150 million into state hospitals to cut elective surgery queues. 25,000 extra procedures in the first year was the target. 14,000 have now been performed. To be able to then already get to 55% of the procedures that we're committed to is really excellent work. State health ministers are already concerned over increasing demands on their hospitals, with possibly more to come, as many people are allowed to abandon private health insurance. If there is evidence that it has had such an impact, then I'll be the first to put up my hand to say we should be... Uh, are compensated for that. We expect that the Australian healthcare agreement will be flexible enough to ensure that the states are appropriately remunerated for any increase in demand. Not looking so healthy, Brendan Nelson's hold on the Liberal leadership, thanks to relentless speculation that former Treasurer Peter Costello will remain in Parliament and be pressed into the top job. Would Dr Nelson stand aside to let it happen? Maybe. And, uh, I'm certainly not going to talk about hypotheticals in the future, uh, but I am very determined that I will lead the Liberal Party and the opposition to the next election. Paul Bongiorno, 10 News. Coming up, one of the world's most wanted men captured after 13 years on the run and a coffee break of a very different kind in the US. 
and in sport. Kane Corns talks about the showdown and in particular what made the coach so angry with him. Marnie Matner on the Crows finals chances. No go for the Thunderbirds, so who are they targeting for next year? The Opals target Beijing and they're aiming for gold. And why Cadell Evans fears the big Russian in France. Well, it's been a cold, dry day, which means that we're looking forward to a cold, frosty night with temperatures falling way below average. It also means that there will be widespread frost, which is a concern for our market gardeners, especially those north of the city. It's very likely that we'll see widespread frost again tomorrow night and on Thursday night, but by Friday there will be some late showers around. Well, I'll be back at 5 to 6 with all the latest on what's happening with this cold weather.